If you would, my brothers and sisters, let's open our Bibles to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 1. We're going to look at Daniel chapter 1, uh, beginning with verse 3. And um, I'm going to go through the entire text that I had planned to read, uh, but it seems as if I'm going to have to turn this into maybe a series. Hopefully, maybe I'll be finished with the next week, if not the week after next. But there's just a lot here. And I wanted to bring it to you today, so I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of God's Word. We're coming out of the NIV version, Daniel chapter 1, uh, beginning with verse 3. And uh, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had already uh, conquered and destroyed Jerusalem, burnt the temple of God to the ground, and carried off captives uh, to his land. In verse 3, it reads from the Word of God, Daniel chapter 1. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's servants some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility, young men without physical, any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from the tribe of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. Check that out. He gave them new names to Daniel, the name built to Shazar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. How many of you know God will do that? He will cause I'll cause people to show you favor. Uh, but the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my Lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, he said, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and wine that came from the king's table that they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. Now, may the Lord bless the hearing and the reading of God's holy word. Let the people of God say amen. 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 Let's let's go to God in prayer. Eternal God, our Father, we're thankful, Lord, for your goodness, for your presence, for your tender mercies, for this opportunity to share in the word. And Lord, I just pray that you would open our hearts to receive your word. I pray that all of the distractions in our minds that we may have brought in from last week or perhaps what even happened this morning. Lord, I pray uh, that you would help us now to focus on what you would have us to know and how you would have us to apply this word to our lives. And even as Moses ascended on the mountain in humility, he took off his shoes and he bowed down before you. Likewise, in humility, Lord, we bow down and we ask that you would speak to us right now in the name of Jesus. Let the church say amen. Amen. My brothers and sisters, the, the subject of our sharing this morning is how to be faithful in a hostile environment. How to be faithful in a hostile environment. Now, before we really get uh, into the meat of our text, I want you to know that this is not a story about what your diet uh, should consist of. You see, I want you to recognize First of all, that this is the Old Testament and that in this particular context, Daniel is honoring Old Testament dietary laws. But now in the New Testament, under the New Covenant and 
my brothers and sisters, we are people of the new covenant. Uh, these things, all of these things have changed uh, because in Acts chapter 10, it tells us that God has made all food clean. He says, do not declare unclean what I have now made clean. So this message is not about diet. And I don't believe that you have to establish a diet based upon Old Testament laws in order to be healthy. Now, I know that there are a lot of different things in our foods, there are a lot of processed foods, and, and there are a lot of sugar in our foods, too much sugar in them, and things like that. But this message is not about that. I just want to be clear on that. This message is about how to be faithful to God in a hostile environment. And the first thing now I want you to notice in our text, go back to the text, is that the Babylonians, like any other kingdom or nation, they had standards. They had standards that are not the standards of God's kingdom, but they had standards that placed people in certain categories. And in verse 4 of our text, it says that in order to serve in the king's palace, a person had to meet certain standards. Uh, they couldn't have any physical defects or disabilities. They had to be handsome. They had to be a capable and quick learner, which meant that you had to have some level of education already. That's why they chose captives from the royal families of the nations they had conquered. Now, just like the kingdom of Babylon had standards, even today, other world systems kingdoms, nations, and organizations, they have standards as well. Let me give you just a small, small, minute example of what I'm talking about. For example, it, 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 it very well may be that when you apply for a job or whatever, it very well may be that the employer or, or the company has some written standards, but they also may have some unwritten standards that they are looking for standards or, or a certain look in a person or they may look, be looking for a certain age range or a certain demographic that makes them comfortable with hiring someone to be on their team. So now, of course, they may not say that, but this is a part of the system that we live in and we need to recognize that every organization, kingdom, or system, they just have certain standards. Now, the king of Babylon had a system whereby he indoctrinated young men who were taken as captives, captives of war, so that they would serve him and so that they would serve as his liaison between him and those people. And so these young men, the Bible says, they were trained for three years. Uh, they had to learn the language and the literature. That means they had to learn the history and the philosophies and the religion of the Babylonians. Uh, it says that they had to eat uh, the Babylonian cuisine that came from the king's table and that was necessary so that they would understand where their food came from, where all of their necessities came from, so that they would not be inclined to be disloyal to the king. And the Bible says that their names had to be changed. And when you change a person's name, the intent is to change that person's identity until their life matches their new name. You understand what I'm trying to say? When you change a person's name, you're trying to change who they are and you're trying to change who they represent. And you know, we really can't get around this because a very similar thing happened to us and our forefathers here in America. And so now in verse seven, in verse 7, Daniel's name was changed to Belt to Jazar, which means Belt protects the king. And Belt was a false Babylonian king. Belt protected the king. Now, Belt was a false Babylonian king. You know, I was just waiting for something like that to happen. Praise the Lord. They changed Daniel's name to Belteshazzar, which means Baal protects the king. And Baal, of course, he was a false Babylonian god. Now, now Daniel's name, his original Hebrew name, meant God, the living God, is my judge. But they changed his name to represent a false god. Hananiah's name was changed to Shadrach, which means inspired by the moon god. Uh, Mishael's name was changed to Meshach, 
uh, his name meant uh, belonging to the moon god. Azariah's name was changed to Abednego, and his name meant servant to the god of wisdom. All of these were false Babylonian gods, so their names were changed so that they would become believers and servants of these false gods. And the idea, like all worldly ideas and philosophies, the idea was to get them to forget their culture, uh, to forget who they were, and to forget the God that they served. Isn't that something? The king of Babylon wanted these men, he indoctrinated these men so that they could be totally and completely loyal to him and to his gods. Now, even though this happened way back when, I want you to understand that this is still the world's way. Whether it be the God of success, the God of money, the God of power, the God of false religion, the God of sex, or whatever, the culture of this world and its organizations are designed to get you to in some way forsake God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The cultures are designed to get you to compromise on the principles of God's word to make you think that God's word really does not matter. And so in order to combat these kind of things, my brothers and sisters, I've said this before, but you need to know the word of God for yourself. You need to know what God says about you, not what somebody else says about you, but what God says about you. You know, let me give you an example. Um, your professor uh, or your boss or your coworker or people in general will try to find ways to define you. That's just human nature. They will try to find ways to characterize you. But the Father who is our creator and the Son of God who has saved you has something to say about that. And God's word, if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, his word is the highest word in the universe. There is no word and there is no name above his name or above his word. And so you need to know what God says about you, huh? You know, um, I'm just going to use this as an example. You know, you may have been told that you're just like your daddy. He didn't amount to anything and you're not going to amount to anything. He's a deadbeat and you're going to be a deadbeat just like him. You may have heard that, right? You may have heard somebody say, you're just like your mama. She was a drunk and will always be a drunk. She was fast and you are just like her. Or maybe, you know, you've become insecure. And maybe you've said to yourself, I will never be good in school. I'll never go to college. Nobody in my family went to college and nobody is going to support me if I go to college. I don't have a chance. I don't look good enough. Nobody is going to like me. My brother and sister, if you are not careful, when you say things like that to yourself enough, or if you listen to those kinds of things enough, you begin to adopt that kind of mindset. You begin to believe in those things about yourself. But now, but now the word of God offers you an alternative view. Yes, it does. Huh? Because all of that negative stuff the enemy will use to keep you down so that you won't love yourself and so that you will be envious of everyone else around you who you think has a better chance. Huh? And he wants you to walk around with a chip on your shoulder. He wants you to feel that, that God didn't give you a chance to thrive, that God didn't give you a chance to succeed, and that is not the truth, you see. Let me tell you what God says about every believer. In 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 17, the word of God says about every believer, it says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? He is a new creation or creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, now this simply means that you are no longer bound by your genetic makeup. You are no longer bound by your genetic makeup. You don't have to be a slave to anything that enslaved anybody in your family. You don't have to be a slave to alcohol. You don't have to be a slave to drugs. You don't have to get caught up in any negative cycle that you saw transpire in your own family. 
You don't have to beat your wife because your daddy beat your mama. You don't have to sell drugs because everybody in your family sold drugs. You don't have to live in the projects simply because your family lived in the projects. You don't have to be in debt simply because all of your relatives were always in debt. You know, I'm just trying to show you that in Christ, those things do not apply to you anymore. And because of Christ, your new genetic makeup puts you in another category altogether. Do you understand what I'm saying? You are a new creation. The old things that you may have inherited or the old things that you came out of don't apply to you anymore, right? Uh, you know, even in the church. Even in the church, man, we, we wrongly convince ourselves, you know, that we're still just lowly sinners. And in some days, some cases, we just can't do any better. That is a lie. That is, didn't I just say, look at what the word of God, the word of God says, you are a what? A new creation. The word of God says that you are a what? You are a new creature. The old things are what? They are gone. This is what pertains to who you are, to who you are, and you have been made new. Do you follow what I'm trying to say to you this morning? See, the word of God in Daniel's time, the word of God in this alien environment, it sustained Daniel because even though they changed his name, he knew who God said that he was. He knew that he had been chosen by God like all of his people. He knew that God had provided for his people while they were slaves in Egypt. And if God provided for them back then, Daniel knew that God would provide for him while he was still in Babylon. Do you understand what I'm trying to say to you? So see, even though they changed Daniel's name, Daniel knew who he was and they could not change his mind about that. And so don't let anybody or anyone change your mind about who God says that you are. Let me give you another scripture. Let me give you another scripture. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. Galatians chapter 3, verse 6, look what it says. It says, for every believer, it says, for you are all what? You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, right? Now this has nothing to do with, nothing to do with gender, but it has everything to do with the fact that the spirit of the son dwells on the inside of you. For you are all what? Sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now this is very important. Very important because as a new creature, you are like the Son of God, the Lord Jesus. That's who you're like. And you have become a Son of God, not simply because you were born into this world, but you have become a Son of God through what? Through faith in Jesus Christ, who is the original Son of God. So, my brothers and sisters, you are a son. You are not a sinner. You are not a slave. You are not a servant. But you are a son and you have all of the rights and privileges of a son and of the son, right? Let's look at verse 28 in, in Galatians 3. Look at what it says. Here's the word of God. It says, goes on to say that as a new creature, in Christ there is neither what? Jew nor Gentile. That's what it is. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. Why? Because you are all one in Christ Jesus. Do you see that? That means that your race, your ethnicity, your gender, your social status means nothing to God. Because when he looks at you, he sees someone who is like the Lord Jesus. Huh? The word says, look at what it says. It says, for what? For you are all what? One in Christ Jesus. And so, my brothers and sisters, you are God's son. You are God's daughter. You are not a stranger to him. You are not unworthy to him. You are not unlovable to him. You are not a mistake to him. You are not trash to him. You are not anything that the devil or anybody else says you are. But you are God's child. You are his son. You are his daughter. And the Bible says in Romans 8 chapter, 
The Bible says that the same spirit that lives in Jesus and that raised him from the dead lives on the inside of you. Huh? You don't hear what I'm saying to you this morning. I said the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, he does what? He lives in you. Now, my brothers and sisters, if that is the case, if that is the case, why do you think that there are things that you cannot do? You weren't ready for that, were you? If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then why do you think that you cannot do certain things? Why do you limit yourself, huh? In any category or any environment, huh? So what if they don't like your skin tone? So what if they don't like your school, the school you came? So what if they don't like the neighborhood you're from? So what if they don't like the credentials or your lack thereof? The question that you've got to ask yourself is, who do you belong to? And who does God say that you are? I don't care. I don't care how hostile the environment is. If you know who God says you are, you can make it in any environment. You hear what I'm saying? If you know who God says you are, you can make it. If you honor and worship the Lord, you can make it, you can thrive, you can succeed in any environment. You know, the Bible says this to us all the time. David said, because he had a personal relationship with God, David said, you prepare a table before me where? In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. You know what that means? That means I don't care what environment you are in, God can set a table for you so that all of your needs are provided for and your cup will overflow. That's how good our God is. That's why he went on to say, mercy, grace shall follow me all the days of my what? Of my life. And I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Listen, you can thrive in any environment so the question is, are you going to believe who God says you are? Or are you going to believe the enemy? Huh? Are you going to believe what God says about you? Or are you going to believe the peanut gallery and all of the mess that they keep up? You know, a lot of times when you're in leadership, you know, you got mess sometimes all around you. Are you going to listen to that mess? Or are you going to be who God has called you to be. You know what God said to Daniel? God says to Daniel, he says, he says, no matter where you are, Daniel, no matter if you're in Jerusalem, which is your hometown, or whether you are in Babylon, you are my son. You are my treasured possession. I chose you. I called you out of darkness into the marvelous light and you belong to me. When you walk through the water, huh, they shall not harm you. Huh? When you walk through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be consumed because I am the Lord your God. Huh? You can make it. You can thrive. You can succeed in any environment as long as you know who you are and whose you are. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. The doors of the church are open. And you know, we invite you to become a part of us, not a perfect church, striving to be all that God would have us to be. If you don't have a church home, we invite you to join us. But now, if you don't know the Lord Jesus, if you don't know him, if you've never given your life to him, now is the time. Not tomorrow. Our Lord is a right now kind 
of God and today he can deliver you today he can save you today he can set you free from whatever holds you in bondage will you give your life to him right now